besides uh, Dr. Greer here, we have what I consider some real icons of the 20th century, the late 20th century. And uh, they had a human, uh, tr tremendous influence in the early 60s, and that influence continues today, and I'm sure many of you have been influenced by Dr. Metzner and his colleagues, Timothy Leary and Dr. Ralph Albert, who became Ram Dass. I mean, uh, Richard Albert, who became Ram Dass, sorry. And uh, there, it's hard to, to, it's hard to uh, say enough about how much they influenced me. And I, I have to tell you, I had to dig very deep in my closet to find uh, this little vest to honor the decade that we're talking about. <laughs> And Dr. Metzer has his own foundation, and he also has a list of his other books up here for you to pick up um, at the end of the conversation. We also want to introduce, introduce Peggy Hitchcock, who's going to have a conversation. She has a section in the book, and I think we're going to hear some very interesting things um, from the both of them. Peggy was obviously a very early supporter of their work in serious psychedelic studies. And she has supported them all the way through and continues to support the resurgence that's happening now in psychedelic study, studies for serious uh, therapeutic uh, uh, service. So uh, she remained a good friend of Timothy Leary's uh, all the way to his death. And she even introduced him to the woman who became his wife. So I'm going to let them say a little bit more about themselves and we'll get into the book. And we really want to thank you again for coming. It's great to see the locals out here supporting, uh, supporting this work and, and this movement. Uh, briefly, the Hefter Research Institute does psychedelic research at, at NYU, Johns Hopkins, and University of Zurich in Switzerland with psilocybin, uh, focusing on treatment of cancer patients with anxiety and understanding how consciousness uh, works in the brain. And is, uh, as Michael said, Peggy continues to support this work and this, and I'm glad Ralph is here because Ralph is the person who got me started in a whole career of psychedelic research when I first finished my residency in 1979. No, 19, yeah, 1979, yeah, when we first met. So, way back there. Way back there, not as far back as this book is, but uh, it's important. So Ralph, I wanted you to start by talking about how this book came into being. Okay. Okay, so I have this lavalier mic. Is this working okay? Yeah, perfect. So, um, yes, and I, I want to add a word of appreciation. The what? long mic is only for the camera, so this microphone oh. has to go back. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, so, um, so I just put it on here? Yeah, whatever you want to yeah. do. Yeah. yeah, I'm wired. To the girls. <laughs> so um, Ramdas and I had been talking um, several times about we ought to write, you know, our recollections before we both, you know, shuffle off this mortal coil, and um, because Leary had written but we hadn't. So and then we thought, but we couldn't figure out how to do it. Uh, we, we lived nearby in Northern California at that time, and um, but we couldn't figure out how could we do that. You know, how could we? And uh, part of the problem was, well, um, uh, you know, it's, it's such a complicated story, and it had a lot. Of, some elements of it had a, there was a lot of charge. There was, you know, some incidents that happened that we were both involved in that were tense between us and, and con conflict, conflicted. So. Um, then the idea came up, well, why don't we record some interviews and uh, then transcribe them in that way? And that seemed like a good idea. But that also had a problem because Ramdas, by that time, had had a stroke. So he was talking, his way of talking was very halting and slow. And mine tends to be fast. I thought, this is not going to be fair. You know, because, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but then, and also, but then we hit on the idea of yeah, doing the interview and, and to get around this question of how to um, how to organize it to ask somebody else and uh, uh, Gary Bravo is a psychiatrist and 
we were happy to have Gary Bravo uh, moderate our conversations with us, just as we're happy to have George Greer, the psychiatrist, to moderate the quiz. We have the psychiatric uh, uh, affidavit that uh, we're not crazy, you see. <laughs> it's very important to us. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm very glad it worked out that way, because then Gary organized uh, organized the discussion, you know, and Ramdas and I smoked pot, but we told Gary, no, you can't smoke pot because you have to keep us on track. And, uh, and he out outlined the sequence of events and then would ask us questions, what happened then, and how did you first meet Leary, and how, what happened in that project, and like that. And so that gave us the assurance we could handle any difficult things that came up. And as it turned out, we were actually very fortunate that it, um, uh, I, I think it had, in the long run, uh, you know, a very beneficent effect. And then, and it was very interesting. Then we had written it, we transcribed it, we did three three-hour interviews, <coughs> and uh, transcribed them, and then follow-up interviews. And we, so we had a text. We didn't have a publisher, and uh, and I was showing it around to. Uh, the whole process took about five years. So I'm, you know, talking about five years ago, and uh, showing it around to different agents. We couldn't even get an agent to take it. The agents were saying, no, no, nobody wants books about the 60s, and nobody wants books of conversations. Uh, I was getting depressed. You know, I'd been turned down by agents. I didn't even get to the publisher. And uh, so then, um, and I thought, oh, I have to do, publish it ourselves. I have to raise the money and all of that. And then one day, I was at the Synergia Ranch, where uh, the Synergetic Press also is housed. And uh, uh, Deborah Snyder, bless her heart, said, can I help you? And I thought, Wow, you're a publisher. Yes, you can help me. <laughs> and uh, so we have this book, and nobody wants it. And she said, "Well, we want it. We look at it, you know." And they loved it. And so it was the perfect publisher because it's a, it's a book about a subculture. You see, it's a book about a subculture, and they already published books about a subculture. And they published books about the biosphere. And John Allen's incredible, interesting, creative work about the biosphere, uh, which is in itself a subculture that also started in the '60s. Interestingly enough, so. Uh, we were very happy to do it, and then we collected photographs and we collected contributions from 15 other people, uh, including Peggy, our old dear friend, and, um, which is also very important because it's not really about Leary or Albert or me. You know. It's about a whole group of people, a uh, wide number of people, uh, and, and different aspects of it, different countries, of course the United States, but different countries around the world. Uh, connecting in new ways and having a common interest in consciousness expansion. And I think the conscious, concept of consciousness expansion is kind of a key, one of Leary's key concepts. And it was very interesting to me that only recently, you know, in the last several years, I, I've become close to Albert Hoffman, who's the Swiss chemist who died at the age of 103, uh, who was the discoverer of LSD and also the, uh, synthesized the active principle in the Mexican mushroom. A brilliant uh, chemist, very humble and you know, who, very spiritual, mystic man, a combination of mystic and scientist. And he, I came across a letter I, I hadn't seen from Tim Leary to Albert Hoffman, 1961, at the very beginnings of our Harvard Psilocybin project, where Leary introduced to Hoffman this notion of consciousness expanding. And, uh, and Hoffman wrote back, and uh, this is a letter I hadn't seen, uh, in which he said, he really appreciated that way of looking at it because he felt that to only consider these substances from the point of view of medical and psychiatric pharmacological research, which was of course the origin of a drug, was uh, too limiting. And that the religious implications and the creative, for the creativity implications <laughs> ought to be explored. And he had himself urged Aldous Huxley, who was kind of his mentor, that that should happen. <coughs> So that really, and, and, and that was a very unusual thing for him to say because he was a very mainstream conservative scientist who had no conscious knowledge of mysticism or religion or anything like that. But, you know. So um, I think that would, um, uh, in retrospect, I've come to really appreciate that concept more and I like that idea of consciousness expansion actually even better than the label of psychedelic because psychedelic, first of all, you know, it's a technical term that you have to explain. It's become associated with drugs. And it's, it's like my daughter came home from school one day at the age of 12 and said, oh, that looks psychedelic. You know, but she didn't. It's a genre of pop art. 
right? Yeah. It's a genre of pop art, swirly kind of paisley patterns, which is not really that significant part of a psychedelic experience, you know. If it was all about swirly paisley pattern, who would care? Right? <laughs> it's about consciousness expansion, and that's a really interesting concept, because it uses two words that are common words. And you, you, you hear the concept of consciousness expansion, and you ask yourself, what does that mean? What kind of a thing is consciousness that it can expand? <laughs> And that I call a divination question. It's a divination question that you ask yourself, because it implies that there's something in you that knows more than you do, a kind of a wise self or intuitive self. Every time you say to the thought, I ask myself anything, that implies that you believe that there's something in you that knows more than you do. Interesting, isn't it? Because why would you ask otherwise? And that's what I call divination. And I've become, maintained an interest in, you know, long after the Harvard studies were completed and the Millbrook work that we talk about here, in consciousness expansion, and I taught consciousness, uh, states of consciousness, all the states of consciousness at, uh, at the graduate school where I taught for 20 years, and uh, what are some of the common properties. And I recently, I'll just mention this briefly, started writing a series of uh, seven books, of which the first, first four have appear, appeared. The first one is called The Expansion of Consciousness, and it's individual and collective. The second one is on the roots of war or domination. And the third one is on our chemical divination, which is a process of working, ac the subtitle is Accessing Your Spiritual Intelligence for Healing and Guidance. And it's independent of whether psychedelic drugs are used. It's not a method for using psychedelic drugs. The psychedelic drugs I come to see as really as amplifiers of perception. And uh, the di process of divination doesn't depend on them. It can be amplified with them, but it can be done without them. And we know that, you know, because you can do divination through dreams or through visions or spontaneous, or you can do it with tarot or astrology or the I Ching, you know, divination accessories. And uh, the fourth in the series is called is looking at states of consciousness in general, all kinds of states of consciousness, the very ordinary ones like dreams that we know in the sleep. You know, you're in a state of consciousness right now. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> it's called the waking state, the functional waking state, right? It lasts, all state of consciousness are defined from the boundaries of time, two transition points. It starts when you wake up and it ends when you fall asleep. And, uh, you know, drug state starts when you take the drug and it ends when the drug wears off. So it's like that. So in my classes, I try to kind of make it clear that states of consciousness vary all the time. And it's our, you know, uh, the thing we should do is learn to identify the state we are in, make use of the positive ones, and learn how to navigate out of and through the negative ones. And that's what the fourth book is about, mind space and time stream. So, so uh, yeah, Ralph, uh, you, you had a, a, a selection to Get the mic. Yeah. Yeah, Ralph, I wanted you to, you had a selection in the book you were going to read to us, and you want to do now would be a yeah. good time for that, I think. Okay, uh -huh. okay. All right, so, um, so this is, uh, the book is about five parts, and the first part is about the studies at Harvard, and there's a part about the interlude some training programs we did in Zihuatanejo in Mexico in the summers of two years. And then uh, the third part is when uh, living uh, at Harvard uh, in communities after Harvard stopped sponsoring the research with psilocybin, but we were still at Harvard and working together in various ways, kind of gradually separating from the university. And then the fourth part is about Millbrook, this community we had in upstate New York. And then the fifth part is kind of concluding reflections. So this is. This is an, an experience um, uh, that a group of us had in, uh, towards the f close of the first year uh, of the beginning of the project. So uh, here's what I say. In the first two years or so at Harvard, <clears throat> doing the prison project, we did a prison project, and studies on psilocybin in a supportive environment, the Good Friday study, which was on a religious experience, and others, we worked exclusively with psilocybin. The graduate students working with the project, George Litwin, Gunther Weil, and I, and sometimes Michael Kahn, would also do sessions among ourselves and with friends. 
uh, all of them have accounts in the book, by the way. We collected experience reports from the participants, and they always involved some objective study of some kind as well. For example, we did studies on the changes in the perception of time. We would have these sessions that were very interpersonal. Nowadays, I wouldn't do a session that way. We would sit and take psilocybin and keep talking, whatever was going on. <laughs> Sometimes it would be funny and we'd laugh a lot. We weren't using it to go inside and do meditative explorations. We didn't know how to do that. Uh, sometimes there would be insights into relationship dynamics. I remember we called it the love drug, much as MDA was called in the late 1960s and early 70s in San Francisco, and then MDMA in the 1980s, which later became known as ecstasy. It could open up communication between people at tremendous depth. I remember a group of us did one session with psilocybin out by the ocean on Cape Cod. We camped out on the beach, and it took psilocybin at night with a fire. Everybody bonded so much that we couldn't end the session. We went to have breakfast, and we said we should all get married to each other. <laughs> let's see, let's start with the two of you and the two of us. It was that bonding. So Ramdas says, that was a very social drug, extremely social. And I say, I'd say that was the intention or the set we brought to it, and the kind of setting we created, and the way we used the drugs. And he says, the way we used them, yes. And then I say, I think nowadays people that use mushrooms for consciousness expansion probably would not use it that way. Also, traditional Mazatec shamans and the ancient Aztecs, as far as we can tell, did not use them that way. They used them for divination and healing. If you want to get the real <coughs> lessons of the mushrooms, you have to stop talking and start listening to what's coming through from within. The mushroom Ramda says, gives you a shift in the point of perception. Well, and I say there was a psilocybin that was very significant for me that I've always wanted to talk with you about. It was November 1961, a cold winter night, at your house, Ramda, in Newton. It involved Tim, you and me, George Litwin, Gunther Weil, and Michael Kahn. Maynard and Flo Ferguson, Maynard the jazz trumpeter, you know, came, also came a bit later in the evening. I think our intention was to take stock of where we were after a year of working together. We all took psilocybin except Tim, who may have taken a low dose of LSD with some people in New York and then come up. Is this ringing any bells? Ramda says, it's ringing very, very remote bells. One of the interesting things in the conversation we discovered is this was a very significant session for me, but it was barely registered in Ramdas's memory. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. individual differences are very significant. And, and I say, on the way driving to the session, Michael Kahn had raised this question about the Catholic Church's teaching concerning the sin against the Holy Ghost. This was the worst sin, the one unforgivable sin, because it denied the very possibility of forgiveness and denied the reality of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Michael said it was like a projective test in the Middle Ages for your worst imaginable sin, the unforgivable sins. And uh, uh, I'll just interject here that Michael Kahn was uh, a fellow graduate student. He's a little older than me. He had a career as an actor. He was a, formerly a Shakespearean actor. He had very tall and has a large, very large, booming, dramatic, intense voice. So everything he said came through with tremendous emphasis and intensity. So Michael said it was like a projective test in the Middle Ages for your worst imaginable sin, the unforgivable sin. There was an intense discussion going on among the four of us, Michael, George, Gunther, and me, about sin and good and evil and so forth, as the effect of the psilocybin came on. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> How naive we were, you see. And at one point, George Litwin asked, well, what about marginal cases? How did the church decide marginal cases? Like, what if I'm this guy who takes these pills and meets God, and I talk to God, and we have this great conversation, and after I come back, people say I'm bad or evil. What then? <laughs> what would the church say to something like that, to someone like that? He was asking the question of Tim, and Tim, Shall I just go on? Or just go on. Tim, he was asking this question of Tim, and Tim was completely speechless. He didn't know what to say. I can imagine, in retrospect, he probably thought, 
why is he asking me this question? <laughs> I had become caught up in this theological issue and added to the tension by saying, yes, Tim, what would they say, the church, in a situation like that? And of course, still, Tim still couldn't or wouldn't say anything. I remember having this realization that we were confronting the issue of whether what we were doing was good or bad, or even worse, whether it was taboo and whether we would be or were being judged. Then Gunther started attacking Tim for getting involved in a New York drug scene that he, Gunther, knew was sinister and decadent. He said, you know, Tim, there was a time that I idolized you. I thought you were great. But now I don't know. I see you getting involved in these bad drug scenes. I think I may leave. More silence from Tim and everyone. Then Gunther said, you know, Tim, only a Jew and a Catholic could have a conversation like this. <laughs> it's a very, very tense atmosphere, complete silence. And George Litwin spoke up and said in a ringing voice, now wait a minute, guys. I am neither Jew nor Catholic, so I think I can speak here with some impartiality. There's this old tradition of putting some people up and then killing them or tearing them down. We don't have to do that anymore. You know there's another tradition, that of the Declaration of Independence, which says all beings are created equal and should treat each other as equals. It was magnificent. Everybody heaved a profound sigh of relief. Maynard and Flo cheered, and it was like a fog was lifted. A fog of religious bigotry had entered the room, and through George's statement, it was completely dissipated. Ramdas says, far out. <laughs> but he was there, but he actually couldn't remember it. So then I said, Tim later said that during that scene, he couldn't figure out what was going on. And he felt like a figment of George Litwin's imagination. <laughs> and that he, Tim, didn't really exist. I think that experience made us all much more sensitive and careful about the power of projections and idealizations and how they could be enormously magnified in a psychedelic session. For Tim, it reinforced his rejection of any kind of spiritual leadership roles. He was determined not to play the guru game. He'd get quite pissed off when he felt that someone was projecting that on him. His model was that of a baseball team and he'd be the temporarily the captain or coach, but those were just temporary roles in the game. So, Peggy, uh, now if you could read the selection you, yeah. you picked out, which is about, I think, the first uh, summer, I guess, this group went to Mexico as a group to do, uh, to do psychedelic sessions. And were those with uh, psilocybin or LSD or both? Or? Which? In, the, the, in Zihuatanejo. This was all with LSD. All with LSD. Okay. So no, no longer had any psilocybin. Okay. The psilocybin project was closed down. Well, to say the least, it was an extraordinary summer. And, um, yeah, it was really an amazing experience. And we all went down there. We'd found this place. I think we went in Richard's plane. I don't remember for sure. But anyway, at that time, he was flying a plane. His, his pilot skills got increasingly less good as time went on. <laughs> but anyway, we found this place which was really only accessible by airplane or bus. And it was a very, um, at that time, is that too, too close? Yeah. It was a very remote at that time. Now it's like right next to the huge resort, and it's not at all remote. But anyway, <clears throat> so we rented this hotel from this grumpy Swiss man. I don't know if it's still Hotel, hotel Catalina. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. Maybe it still exists. It still exists. I, I don't know if he, Carlos, his name was. Anyway, no. so he was delighted to have us because it was the summer, and you know, no one much came in the summer then because uh, it was a rainy season. Anyway, so here we are. I went to Mexico with Tim and Richard to explore Zihuatanejo, oh, which Richard had seen from his plane. At the time, it was a sleepy little coastal town there was one hotel, yeah, he was very happy, blah, blah. I was very excited about the opportunity to experience psychedelics in a nurturing environment. I remember one particularly amazing LSD session when I came out of the sea as an amphibian, transforming into a four-legged and then a two-legged being. 
Tim would always ask us what insights we had gained. I remember thinking how simple everything was, that in order for positive change to occur, the cosmic timing had to be right. I shared this insight with him, and I could see that he thought it trivial. I still believe that timing is a most important factor in effecting change. I could feel the interrelationship of everything in my life. I knew that if the timing was not right, change was not going to happen for me or for anybody. I don't believe that Tim ever really got that point. Uh, I never spent a night in a high tower on the beach, but I did spend a whole night on the beach during an LSD session. I remember one very weird scene when I was in an altered state of consciousness, went down to the beach for a late night swim alone. A drunken man from the town emerged from the shadows to confront me with a knife. One of our friends, Buster, who was a pot dealer from Boston and very street savvy, suddenly and magically materialized by my side to disarm him. Perfect timing, for which I was most grateful. Then the baseball came, the baseball game, which Tim organized. Ah, that was really the finale of the summer. Um, Tim organized Harvard versus the Zewatanea home team. <laughs> well, baseball was the big game down there. It was definitely the grand finale. Tim was a great fan of baseball, which was the most popular game in Zewatanea. We all agreed that by ending the summer with a baseball game, we would end our stay on a high note. Our Harvard team all took LSD, unbeknownst, of course, to our opponents. <laughs> our team's sense of timing was greatly enhanced, and to our dismay, we started winning. We started winning. We did not want to win, of course, since our goal was to generate a feeling of goodwill in the town. As I remember, I only played one or two innings. Almost everyone else somehow managed to play out what seemed like a very long nine innings. I'm happy to say the home team of Ziwatanea won, to everyone's delight. <laughs> See, is that the end? Oh. As the summer ended and I became more involved with Tim, we decided that I would be part of... Hmm. Oh, sorry. I would be part of the community which had evolved from our summer experiences. Richard, Tim, Ralph, Susan, Foster Dunlap, and Barbara Dunlap, and her daughter would all share a house in Newton Center, Massachusetts. I had my own room there, but also kept my apartment in New York City. I was a community member of the community, spending at least half my time. One memory I have about the house in Newton Center is the weekend I came up to find Tim in a frenzy of deconstruction, knocking down walls to make the kitchen area bigger. As I remember, someone else did the reconstruction. Tim was very good at knocking down, but not that interested in building them back up. Tim and I had a swinging door relationship. Looking back, I doubt that he was really ever truly in love with me. He was certainly intrigued, interested, and loved my sort of spirit of adventure. We had a very strong connection, probably a karmic one. I fell in love with him during that summer in Ziwatanea. To me, he was at the time, the most fascinating person I had ever met. I loved the way his mind worked and his enormous sense of fun and adventure, which was totally contagious. My partnership with Tim evolved as we became close friends and lovers. Fortunately, I had not yet gone down to Zibuetaneo. Fortunately, I did not go down the second summer when the training course was uh, expelled from Mexico, nor was I part of the Caribbean caper, for which I am most grateful as I have not heard one single thing about that experience that wasn't really dark. Somehow I always managed to be absent when legal complications arose. Good karma, I think. I was never financially involved in the project other than paying towards my room and helping to pay for groceries when I was there. I think many people assumed I was much more financially involved with Tim than I was. He was not bothered by going into debt. He was a very proud Irishman. He never asked me for money. I think he felt he had to make it on his own, which was, in a larger context, rather sad. He never included me in a discussion where he would say, here's what we need in terms of resources. Is there a way you can help? Perhaps he also had a cultural bias because I was a woman of whom he, with whom he was involved, and he would not feel comfortable asking me for money. Much later, after Tim's Laredo marijuana bust, I pitched in along, of course, with many other people, giving and raising money to pay his huge legal fees. 
When Tim and his party were all kicked out of the Caribbean and had to leave Antigua, the question was where would they go? Or rather we, since I was part of the group, even though I had not been there. We were running out of places. Luckily, my twin brothers, Billy and Tommy, who had just turned 21, had come into a considerable amount of money. They had decided to invest this money in a large thousand acre property in Millbrook, where they could raise cattle and take a large tax deduction for the activity. Several houses were already existing on the property. One of them was a very large, turreted, rambling Victorian home in which Mr. Dietrich had lived, but which had not been inhabited for some time. My brothers decided to occupy the newer, more comfortable mansion known as the cottage, which Dietrich had built for his son. I was aware that the large Victorian home existed, so Richard and I went down to check it out. We thought it was perfect. I spoke to my brothers, and they happily agreed to rent it to our community for a dollar a year. This seemed to us like a perfect solution to the immediate housing problem for our experimental community. Um, I have a lifelong memory of an extraordinary session with DMT, which was brought to Newton Center by a friend, Ralph von Eckersberg, and given by injection. I had an inversion to needles, partly from having lived with a junkie, and I thought this was a perfect opportunity to overcome my fear. The experience was one of total dissolution into molecular particles. I no longer existed. It was utterly blissful, an experience of emptiness. I remember vividly not wanting to come back. I also knew that I would not want to do it again. I have a lifelong eating disorder, which is something that's always present somewhere in my psyche. When I was in therapy in the 60s, I never even mentioned it, as there was no, so much shame involved. Part of me was not happy to be present. Psychedelics helped me enormously by expanding the horizons of my being, by strengthening and confirming my spiritual focus. They did not help with grounding and with learning how to be here on this earth, which has been a major issue for me in this lifetime. Psychedelics opened up a world of endless possibilities. Then, okay, I still had to come back and take out the garbage. For many people, as for me perhaps, Buddhism has provided a container for what we have experienced during a psychedelic experience. Buddhist teachings have helped to integrate these experiences for me. The great thing about Tibetan Buddhism is it has a belief system. It's very expansive and yet very grounded and pragmatic. That's Thank it. You. Thank you very much. And Ralph, you had one more selection you wanted to. Well, um, yeah. You're, you're the timekeeper. Well, maybe we should forego that. We've got like a couple, just a couple of minutes. Uh, before that, for, for questions then? No. No? You want him to read it? Okay. Well, maybe one, one of them. Yeah, from the end. From, yeah, from the end. Yeah. From, the, from the concluding chapter, I'll, uh, <clears throat> um, the concluding chapter, we talk about, you know, I, I, I want to make sure, maybe emphasize that. You know, we didn't write this book just to, to tell stories, you know, relate gossip from the olden days, as juicy as that may sometimes be, um, and interesting and all that. But like, what is the significance of it, of that period? And I ha actually have the thought that, <clears throat> and I've had the thought and discussed this with Ramdas, that, you know, American culture, I think, needs to do a reevaluation of the 60s. The mainstream idea of the 60s and of psychedelics and of Leary, for that matter, involves a, a lot of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Many people seem to think in the mainstream media that the 60s was a kind of a lost decade. And uh, this is totally not true, and, uh, because it's this period of profound cultural upheaval and transformation that had all kinds of long-lasting effect. LSD was one part of it. It was not the only thing by any means. Think back about the anti-war movement, the environmental movement, the women's movement. Uh, all of these movements came out of the 60s. And um, so, um, um, so I'm hoping, uh, thinking that this book will contribute to a reevaluation of the 60s at a time when our mainstream culture is kind of imploding, as you know, because of the consumerist capitalist system has shown itself to be you know, not viable and not sustainable for millions of people. So um, in this last section, we have a discussion about what? So just hold it in your hand. About Leary and the prohibition of LSD research. 
So Gary Bravo asks us, what's your view of the opinion among many medical psychiatric researchers that Tim was responsible through his irresponsible attitude and statements for psychedelic research being stopped? And I say, yes, I've had a public disagreement with my friend Myron Staroff about this point, although I think now we no longer disagree. He was working with the Menlo Park Creativity Research Project, and they were told that their license for psychedelic research would not be renewed because of Tim Leary. In one of his letters to me in India, Tim told about a meeting with Myron on the group in which they asked him to tone down his rhetoric. I'm sure that's true that the FDA used Tim's behavior as a rationale for their denial. But whether they would have permitted research on psychedelics to continue if Tim hadn't been so public in his enthusiasm is another question. After all, his influence has long been officially denigrated, and he's long gone. And the amount of officially sponsored research is pathetically small compared to what this was in the 1960s, except now it's actually changing in the last few years quite significantly but that's like 40 years later. <laughs> and uh, there were six alcoholism treatment programs with LSD in North America in the late 1960s. I think it was the spread of the drug into the general public out of the control of the medical psychiatric establishment which freaked them out. Our group was not responsible for that, especially since the IF IF project never really took off. I mean, the IF IF project was, we were, supply the drug to people and the guidelines on how to use it. But we never did supply the drug to the people because at that time we couldn't get it and it was illegal. So all we could do was say, this is how you use it and write a book on how to do it. And um, so if you're going to blame anyone for the spread to the masses, it would be more the Kesey group and the electric Kool-Aid acid tests in the Eastman. In any event, you know, who did sessions for thousands of people, thousands of people at a time. In any event, it's not really necessary to blame anyone. It was a complex kind of cultural revolution, a revolution in collective consciousness with many different factors playing into it that had its own momentum with long-term effects that we're still pondering. Our approach was always small groups of people, like 12 or so at a time. The set and setting was psychological, spiritual, and creative. The purpose was personality change and transformation, though not necessarily exclusively as an adjunct to psychotherapy as in the psycholytic model. And Ramdas says, we were con contacting the psychiatrist with a new model, a new approach. And I say, yes, and they wanted to control it in their way within the psychiatric mental health model that was current at the time, which was very biological, just like now. A disease model where you find a drug that will knock out the disease. Psychedelic substances don't fit that model very well, although people did try. I used to go to these talks at colleges where they put me on a program with Sidney Cohen, a psychiatric expert who had given LSD to Cary Grant and Henry Luce and several other Hollywood celebrities in the 1960s, I'd be featured as being for the drugs, and he'd be the cautious expert worrying and warning about dangers and so forth. I felt it was a false dichotomy right there. I was not a drug advocate. I said, these are things we've discovered. Here are methods that can be used. I wasn't saying everybody or anybody should do it. I was saying, think for yourself. Look for yourself. Become informed. I felt I was trapped into this duality. Um, very strange, polarizing, but that's the way the system goes, action and reaction. And whether things would have been different, any different, if Tim had been more circumspect, who knows? Somehow, I don't think so. Okay, we have about 15 minutes for questions, and I want to start with someone the furthest most person who has a question, since you're so back, far back there, I want to give all a chance to get a question. Okay, the blue, uh, the blue shirt there, you, yes. Can you explain, Doctor, the meeting or the convergence of uh, Kesey people that came out on the bus and converged on Millbrook and the differences or similarities between the West Coast acid heads and the East Coast? You, you touched on that briefly. Okay. The question is about the the difference uh, about what happened when the Kesey group came to Millbrook and what were the differences in those two groups. So who yeah. wants to take that? Yeah. Yeah. So there, there, there is a story that we relate that's in the book when Ken Kesey and um, um, Neil Cassidy and a group of about 12 people came in this psychedelic painted bus with the uh, sign further on it and arrived in Millbrook 
And then um, Tom Wolfe wrote about that encounter in his book, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. And he created the scene as, as if it was a kind of a, you know, this wild creative bunch arriving and we were a bunch of constipated, stuffed, you know, <laughs> guys from Harvard who wouldn't talk to them. Well, the point was, I mean, so it made the funny story for Tom Wolfe, but it was actually a false story because they arrived without telling us they were coming, you know. And, and, and Tim was coming, was, Tim was actually sick in bed. And we, it was like late at night. We didn't know they were coming. We were tired, you know. And so it was a little, you know, they arrived, you know, rollicking high on speed and asked them God knows what. And uh, wanted to, I mean, we did show them around. My wife Susan showed them around and we talked to them. Well, you showed them around? That's good. And they were there and they had a good time. We had a good conversation. And Kesey and Larry got along fine, you know, they talked. And so, so that story is, you know, uh, but in, we do also discuss the different, they were operating on a different paradigm. Now our paradigm was consciousness expanding within psychological, spiritual, religious, creative framework. And uh, their paradigm was more just take it and go far out, further, like on the bus, no matter how far, you know, no matter how far. And uh, no structures, make up your own structures as you go along. And. Um, and as I said, you know, they would have mass uh, sessions, which from our paradigm would, would be insane to take LSD with 2,000 people. You know, what's the set and setting? What's the structure? But as it turned out, uh, the structure was provided by the bands, the Grateful Dead, because they played the whole time. So people could freak out, and other people would take care of the people who took freaked out, and the band would keep, the music would keep going, and people would keep dancing, and it worked out okay. And that's the same paradigm as you have of the Burning Man. That's the same paradigm that's kind of continued with, with more, more control. So. Yes? Uh, the question is about recent research on psychedelics, and I guess I, I can answer that. Um, uh, there, our institute is focused on medical uses for psilocybin, primarily with uh, anxiety and terminal cancer patients. So we finished one study at uh, Harbor UCLA, which is submitted for publication, and the patients, uh, just with one session of psilocybin, uh, most of them had a dramatic decrease in anxiety and just a better connection with themselves and could have uh, be more at ease with their families and have a better quality of life after after death. And there's some videos uh, on uh, at our website hefter.org that shows one of the uh, one of the subjects talking about her experience. Um, there's also a study uh, with LSD in Switzerland, and uh, I believe that's also with cancer patients. Uh, there's a study with MDMA at Harvard now for also cancer patients, and um, and there's studies with MDMA for post-traumatic stress. Uh, here in the U.S. has been finished, and they're starting one in actually in, Jor in Jordan with uh, soldiers who have post-traumatic stress in Jordan, and then starting also in Israel with people with post-traumatic stress from, from terror attacks and, and military there. So, and then in Switzerland, the, the research is more basic science. Uh, with what does psilocybin do in the brain and measuring that with three-dimensional EEGs and uh, PET scanning to show where in the brain is psilocybin activating and there's three-dimensional videos of, of how psilocybin works in the brain. So, and then we next want to start a, tr a treatment of addiction with uh, psilocybin because addiction was one of the great sort of medical benefits of psychedelics, but it, the research wasn't structured in a way to meet current standards. So that's, in a nutshell, what's going on. You mentioned the MAPS conference. Yes, and in a, a month from now in San Jose, there will be a conference uh, sponsored by another group, MAPS, uh, with all, basically all the current psychedelic researchers will be there to discuss, discuss their work and, and how they do it. And there's a cards, there's some cards around about that conference. In, uh, in July. Well, there's also a flyer about my books, but there's some cards on some of the chairs. Also the right? one in the <coughs> uh, research. One in that's the one I meant. Oh, he was talking about yeah. in July. The two different no, it's in, it's in, in April. In, oh, yeah, in, in April. April. Yeah. In April. Yeah. yeah. In San Jose. San Jose. Okay, yes. Yes, uh, Ron 
Bond uh, went on to uh, be with me and Corolla Robert and Adrian. And Peggy, uh, you got involved in Tibetan Buddhism. I'm wondering, Ralph, did you find that the uh, uh, your drug experience uh, moved you towards a spiritual discipline? So the question, uh, the questioner says that uh, Ram Dass studied with Neem Karoli Baba, Peggy got involved with Tibetan Buddhism, and asking Ralph, did it lead him to some sort of spiritual practice or discipline? Well, um, I, I've remained a lifelong um, uh, fan and student of Buddhism and Taoism and Hinduism, you know, and, and um, I didn't go on the bhakti path, which the bhakti yogic path, um, is the one that Albert Ramdas followed, which is where the central practice is devotion to the guru and surrender to the guru. Both Leary's and my attitude was more the jnana yoga, the scientific exploration, and uh, but you know the, uh, spirituality and conscious uh, integration of spirituality and psychology and uh, physical transformation, transformation, the principles of transformation. I've written several books on transformation has been a central thing. And I did get immersed in a Western esoteric school of yoga teaching called the School of Actualism, uh, founded by a teacher called uh, Russell Schofield, which I was pretty much full-time uh, uh, practicing and studying for about eight years, eight to ten years, and uh, still use the methods and the practices of it. It's a kind of a, uh, it's a kind of very focused meditation using internal light fire energies sort of akin to Taoism and Tibetan Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, like that. So. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think your question is that really um, one that's, um, you know, very profound. I think, you know, I personally think that every human being has a longing for a spiritual connection. Uh, I think it's part of what it means to be human, whether we recognize it or not. That's just my opinion. I may be totally wrong. <laughs> but, um, from my experience, and only my experience, I would say yes, that certainly psychedelics amplifies very greatly that connection. And how it manifests in your life is another matter. It would depend on what, what your path is, what your spiritual orientation is, how, how the messages that you receive, um, you know, how they affect you. But I, I would say yes, I, I, I know almost no one who has not had that experience uh, in, you know, if they have taken um, psychedelics with any kind of uh, seriousness. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, right here. Um, your, the previous question about um, recent research, um, I'm sure you're familiar or maybe familiar with the work in New Mexico about a decade ago or so uh, by Dr. Strassman at UN Yeah, the, the person just making comment, there was uh, DMT research at the University of New Mexico uh, about uh, uh, 15, 15 or so years ago with DMT and just and, and what does it do and how does it act. Yes. Yeah. yes. There's ongoing ayahuasca sessions going on all the time in the mountains regularly, you know? And ayahuasca, <coughs> I've done a lot of psilocybin with Maria Sabina down in Wildfire the old days. I was a Watson fan. And all I can say is, you should definitely be uh, trying ayahuasca to make your because <laughs> uh, it's so potent. It calls up entities, and I never noticed that acid or psilocybin could or could not, but ayahuasca, you will see entities. You will talk to mescalito, which peyote will do it too, but ayahuasca is the most powerful entheos out there. For those who didn't hear, that you will see entities with ayahuasca. And it's, it's all over the mountains. Guaranteed. <laughs> the question? Uh, yes. Russ, now after so many years of hard work, what would you do differently? What do you think? What went wrong? Why isn't, I guess, why aren't psychedelics used? 
So the questioner is asking Ralph, uh, what, what went wrong and why isn't there more uh, therapy and research going on? I guess. Yeah, um, I, I used to worry about that question a, a lot. Um, you know, did we make a mistake and like that? I don't actually think we did. I mean, what went wrong? I don't think it went wrong either, um, because um, the way I've come to think of it is that that we had our group at the Harvard group. We had an assignment. If you think it was like a spiritual assignment, so to speak. I've come to think of it that way. And our assignment was to find a way to introduce these unusual experiences into the sort of middle class professional class: the psychological, the spiritual, the philosophical, the medical. The medical, spiritual, and our guides were people like Aldous Huxley and you know Alan Watts and Houston Smith, the three eminent religious professional scholars of, of the 20th century, were our teachers, you know, our guides, and they all participated and they counseled us. They gave us this is how you should do it. Aldous Huxley made the suggestion of write this as a manual, you know, using the Tibetan Book of the Dead as a model, and um, and so then for a while, you know, after the this, the, after the whole thing kind of obviously exploded out of the university academic research environment, um, the cat was out of the bag, so to speak, then, uh, and then the sensationalism mushroomed uh, without any particular contribution on our part. It just did because people had their own experiences and they were enthusiastic about them and they wanted to have more of them. See, the same thing happened in the 1980s with a similar drug called MDMA, which was a therapy drug. And people were having wonderful therapeutic experiences with MDMA, and then other people who weren't in therapy heard about it and said, well, I want to have those experiences too. I don't want to necessarily go into therapy. <laughs> and, um, and so then entrepreneurs arise. That's entrepreneurial activity. OK, we'll provide it. It's not illegal, so who cares? It's not illegal. It wasn't illegal. You know, none of these drugs were illegal. So uh, when we started using them. And so then it became illegal. And so then I thought, used to think, and, and we talked about this around us and I, and he agrees with me, you know, well, we somehow failed you know, in our task of introducing these to the culture because it's illegal. But we did introduce it. They are in the culture, you see. It's an underground culture. That's the point. It's an underground culture, which means it's like the mycelium. you know. You know about the mycelium? The mushrooms, it's actually the mycelium, which is underground. You don't see it. You only see the little pop-ups. And, uh, and I know, who knows? You know, is that to be regretted? I no, I no longer regret it. I think it just is the way it is. And I actually think, in retrospect, when I look historically, the Middle Ages, other cultures, as far as I can tell, the use of... Uh, uh, consciousness amplifying substances or mind assisting plants of some kind is always underground and the reason being that it's that it's an essential ingredient in some of the uh, traditions but it's underground because it's so easily misunderstood including by the people who use them who tend to think oh wow you know I take LSD and I see God well it's not that you take LSD it's not a drug effect you see it's not a drug effect because other people take LSD and murder, right? That point will hold driven home to me when Charlie Manson did his thing with LSD. Perversion, murder. What's spiritual about that? So it all depends on who you are, I see. And so the possibility of misunderstanding, not to mention, and it's not because it's a secret plot to overthrow the government, not at all, I don't like the idea of revolution. The point was never to overthrow the government. <laughs> the point was to grow and to expand awareness and to think of new possibilities and create new possibilities of living together, a new kind of environment. A lot of psychedelic researchers became environmentalists and said, well, what, we became aware of the fact that we're polluting the environment, right? I always liked the synchronicity of the fact that Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which was this is the key event that launches the American environmental movement. It was published in 1963, right when we were doing the study. And Silent Spring is a consciousness expanding experience. Do you see that? Because you say Silent Spring, you say, why? Why aren't the birds singing? Why aren't the insects? And then you 
you look and you find out things you didn't know, and then you make different choices. And you say, well, well, we don't want to be doing that. We don't want to be polluting the water and, the, and polluting the soil and the air. And so. I was just going to riff off that last question. Um, how has the psychedelic movement in, in, in this country have impacted or affected our relationship as a culture to death and dying? It's, it's a relationship to the last question. How has the psychedelic movement of the 60s um, in our country impacted our relationship now no. to death and dying? Uh -huh. The question is, how has the psychedelic movement or culture affected uh, our how we relate to death and dying? Yeah. You want to say something about that? No, I think that's a very personal question, but I have no idea. But you could say that maybe, who knows, the hospice movement, all of these things have become very much a part of our culture now. And they weren't there before. So it's hard to say really what the connections are. But I can certainly speak personally uh, that I think uh, many people I know who have an entirely different view of death. And it, as you, it's also interesting to see that the research that's currently being done, the, pr the, the principal use of psychedelics now medically, are all to do with term terminal cancer patients. Am I, I mean, that is the major focus right now. So obviously, hugely, <laughs> I would think. Yes, uh, and uh, I think the two main and most significant culturally areas of application of psychedelic drugs are in the treat number one in the treatment of addiction, alcohol and because alcohol and addiction are alcohol and addiction are and obsessive compulsions are consciousness contracting. So it makes sense to use consciousness expansion as a way to counteract consciousness contraction. Um, and uh, the other is um, in the preparation for dying. And uh, uh, you know Aldous Huxley in uh, said that and he suggested the Tibetan Book of the Dead as a model and he he took LSD on his deathbed and uh, he wrote a whole novel as, uh, of Island where he talks about a ritualized preparation for dying and there have been these studies now at, at UCLA with Charlie Grove uh, and a study that George mentioned where he gave psilocybin to uh, stage four cancer patient. And this, I think, is a breakthrough in medical scientific research because there's no, every, everyone knows it's not a cure for cancer. These are people who have incurable cancer with a prognosis of three, day, three months to live. So to get official approval for that kind of thing is an, already an expansion of the whole institutional system of medical and psychiatric research, which I think is wholly beneficial, beneficent. Because when you think about it, the misunderstanding of what death means is one of the most terrible burdens on culture. And, uh, the, and it's part of the religious heritage that we in the Western world have uh, inherited, which is not shared by indigenous people and Eastern religions. The majority of the world's people understand death to be a transition into another phase of existence to be followed by other incarnations in human life. They take that for granted. And that was wiped out of the Western tradition in the fourth century with terrible consequences. Because what does it do to people to, to think that the end of your life, first of all, it's ethically uh, uh, monstrous because it takes away your responsibility. Once you understand reincarnation, you can't evade responsibility for your actions by dying. <laughs> That has a completely different, you know, and not to mention the, the consolation and the peace that is possible uh, when you understand that uh, by no means is this the end. <laughs> it's the end of this particular form. So I think um, um, those are the, the, the applications. And uh, just one, one interesting kind of confirmation of that is a, in Wa Gordon Wasson, who rediscovered the ancient, the, the ancient Mexican mushroom cult, he, he gives an example, he quotes from a 16th century text written by uh, uh, the Benedictine, I think Benedictine missionary uh, Bernardo de Sahagún, who was sympathetic to the Indians and copied down a lot of 
interviews, did a lot of interviews with him, even though he was a priest and you know gave gave it a kind of a Catholic thing on it. So he describes an informant saying to him how they took these little cyber mushrooms. He said, "Well, we gather together in a." In a, in a house, you know, and then people have different visions of their death. And some say they die violently and they, they drown or fall off a roof, and some die in battle. And, and he kind of says to see how kind of nutty this is and how kind of heretical, you know, to think about death in that way. And why would you? But then he says, well, some of them say they died peacefully in bed, you know, and, and some said had visions of actually being successful merchants. And, doing well with people, <laughs> there were other visions, clearly there were other visions as well, you see, and you get to say, no, these were not like superstitiously deluded people as the priests, but they got together and they did sessions where they envisioned their own dying and, and practiced dying, which is an old philosophical practice. You know, Socrates used to say, wise man is he who, a philosopher is one who practices dying every day. Thank you very much. Well, we want to thank you, and uh, you may wonder why I'm up here. I'm, I was here to promote the idea that the book is here and ready for you, and obviously it worked. I uh, wanted to say a little bit about the book. The book is not only about history, birth of a psychedelic culture. It probably informs us more about the future 